Oh, I am convinced that there's some things that God has called us to be discontent with. We're going to talk about one of those areas in our lives. Today. I want you to open up your Bibles to chapter 14. Before we get there, as you're opening up your Bibles, let's just give a huge round of applause and acknowledgement for Pastor Rudy and the, the crisp, clear word that he gave last week on the line. Let's just give it up for him. Do you want more this morning? Hey, also, our online hosts are going to be posting um, a, 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 uh, an extra teaching that you could pursue in the book of Acts, because we're going to be talking about prophecy and tongues and how to live a balanced, spirit-led life, um, pursuing spiritual gifts. But this is beyond what, what I would typically do as a foundational teaching on the Holy Spirit. I just don't have time. I have 20 minutes left. So in 20 minutes, I don't have time to really go over uh, our, 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 our initial understanding of the, of the filling of the Holy Spirit and, and tongues. But I want you to know where those passages are in the book of Acts so that you can go back and read those passages and invite the Holy Spirit to work in your life. And I hope that you'll approach those statements with that same possibility that God has more. God always has more. This is what 1 Corinthians 14, chapter 1, verse 1 says, Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. Now again, Pastor Rudy did a phenomenal job for you to really understand chapters 12 and chapter 14, which are really the deepest dive that Paul gets to into spiritual gifts. You really have to understand the meat patty right in the middle of this teaching, and it's all about love. We oftentimes hear the chapter on love in relationship to a wedding ceremony, and it's, and it's a wonderful way to bring beautiful poetry, scriptural poetry about love into a wedding ceremony, the, but the original context of that love poem is actually set in between parameters and teaching on spiritual gifts, because Paul knows that it's not enough to pursue love if we aren't also desiring spiritual gifts. Because love needs a context to be expressed. And the context for expression for biblical love is the church, the church community. And so he is talking about, as we, get, as we do a deeper dive into this, how do we express these spiritual gifts in the context of community, in the context of small groups, in the context of services? So I want you to go ahead and open up your Bibles to chapter 14, and we just read verse 1. I'm a little mixed up this morning, but I'm just going to pray that the Lord just brings me back to where... I always, I said this a couple weeks ago, the most anointed part of the sermon is always when the, when the preacher just simply reads the Bible. <laughs> I could just read chapter 14 with no teaching and it would be anointed. I want you to understand that God wants us to pursue and desire more. Uh, I, I, more of what? Specifically, he says here, spiritual gifts, specifically prophecy. Now, a couple weeks ago, I tried to make a case that the spiritual gifts still exist uh, in the church, that we still need the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and we still need the gifts of the Holy Spirit um, at, at our disposal so that the Holy Spirit can use us to be partners with him in ministry. It really requires spiritual gifts, these gifts of grace working in our lives so that we can speak specifically into the areas where people are hurting most but I know that most of us, or many of us, stop pursuing love. Now we don't struggle with that, but we do struggle with eagerly and earnestly desiring spiritual gifts. I love that word earnest. It's just this honest desire. It's not, I want, I want spiritual gifts for my own gain, but I, I'm earnestly with a pure heart, not like Simon in the book of Acts, right? And he asks, how can I get this Holy Spirit? And, and, and it was a, a bad motivation. But how can I earnestly desire spiritual gifts and specifically prophecy? Because I've talked to a lot of people who, even if they believe that tongues and prophecy are something that are in the Bible, which they clearly are. I mean, chapters 12, 13, and 14 are all about tongues and prophecy. You can read all about tongues in the book of Acts. Uh, 
that they have maybe had a bad experience or they're afraid. In fact, I interviewed my brother this last week. I would encourage you if we could post a link to that. There is all sorts of fear about spiritual gifts because of abuse of spiritual gifts or uh, circumstances or personal experiences from when we were younger that still sort of are an obstacle for us assuming that God wants us to have more. And you know what happens in life is it's just a natural process. We, be content, we become content with the wrong things. We become content with our home. We become content with our family. We become content with the circumstances. We become content with our job. And all of those also can be, be gifts that we should be and be happy to be content about. But there's one kind of discontentment that I believe is necessary to live the kind of life, the, live the kind of spirit-empowered missional life that God has called all of us to live in. I want you to understand, Paul doesn't say some of you should desire spiritual gifts. He's assuming that all of you will desire spiritual gifts. And then he says specifically prophecy. How many, listen, I don't think Paul would set you up and not believe that this is not possible for your life. I believe tongues and, pros and prophecy, as I'm going to define them, are not only possible, but something that God desires to do in every single believer's life. Do you have the Holy Spirit? Then you have access to his gifts. Now, I'm not saying that you control them or you do have self-control. You control you. But God gives to these in moments and he pulls back and there are seasons just like I have and retain full authority to say, Judah, you've already had five. No more tonight. OK. <laughs> He's still dad and I'm still son. But Paul speaks about tongues and prophecy as something that we can ask God for more of, that we should earnestly seek God, that we should have this sense of holy discontent. Can we just pause and pray over this particular point? Because I think, honestly, part of the reason, uh, part of the reason why God hasn't given us these gifts is we've simply held back our hand because of fear or abuse. I'm not sure I want that, but if it's legitimate, if it's from God, if I need it and if people need it, this is something in order for our church to be healthy, we've got to keep our hands out like this. And it's not enough just to be open, but it's no father. Give me, please. I need this. That's what earnestly desire is. So let's just pause and just check our hearts. Lord. When all the music's faded. Whether or not the technology is working, your spirit still wants to work. He always is working. You're working in a broken world and you're working through broken people. It gets a little tricky sometimes. It gets a little messy sometimes, but clearly you are working. You worked through Dory just today in our, in our service. I don't know if people could understand her, but I understood her. I was sitting right there and she gave a word about your love and about your truth. It was founded in scripture. And so I just pray that you would open, not just open our hearts, but give us the desire. In Jesus' name, amen. This is what Paul says in verse two, for the one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. Some great definitions. We're going to do a little compare and contrast today with tongues and prophecy. These gifts that Paul says we should be earnestly desiring. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, and the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. Let's just take a pause um, the reason why God desires us to have spiritual gifts is because tongues and prophecy are for building up, not tearing it down. How many of you know that life has a way of tearing us down, but God wants to do the opposite and the church needs to be a place where people aren't torn down, but they're built up. Amen. Nobody needs to convince you that, that you've done wrong stuff, right? You know that. Nobody needs to convince you that, that, that there are things in this world that other people have done to you that was wrong. You already know that. 
But what we need is access to God's careful, meticulous attention to the building up of our spirit so that we become everything that God's called us to be. Otherwise, the obstacles like fear and the, the, the abusive situations that we face hold us back from being everything that God has called us to be. So what is tongues? Then It says in verse 2, it's simply this, communication from us to God. I want to be really clear on, on this point. This is what tongues is. It's prayer. It's prayer. It's me speaking to God. I, I, I want to just be, listen, that is literally what the Bible just said in verse 3, right? Or in verse 2. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men. When I speak in tongues, I'm not speaking to you. I'm speaking to God. What do we call when I speak to God? Prayer. Tongues is prayer. And he says in verse 2, it's mysteries in the spirit. Now, there are three kinds of tongues that we potentially see in scripture. They're the same thing, but they function differently. And I have actually, in the real world, experienced or heard of experiences that actually exemplify every single one of these. We talk about three of them in the interview with my brother. But akalalia is one language when a... When a speaker is speaking in one language and the hearer hears it in his own or a known language. Glossolalia is, a, is when the speaker speaks a language that has no correspondence to a known language. There is a reference to that here. That's what Paul means when he says the speaker utters mysteries in the spirit in his prayer life to the Lord. And then Xenolalia, which is when a speaker speaks a known language... But someone else understands that language, but it's unknown to him. I want you to, I want you to go listen to the interview because we tell a, a couple fun, exciting stories in regards to all three of those versions. Whenever we speak in tongues, it is a gift from the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit empowers, but we are speaking. So it's not like we're being possessed by the Holy Spirit. And God uses it. This is what he says. To build up the speaker primarily, if it's not given in a the context of a gathering. By the way, there is a ton of room to make mistakes when you're praying just by you with you and the Lord. That's why there's really no accountability for this particular gift, because no one knows what you're praying, right? In the context of your prayer closet, all you have to do is pray. Prayer. This is how I would define tongues as a prayer language. It is transrational communication with God. Now, because I'm a man, I can explain this. I don't, I don't know if that is true for all men, but sometimes I get tired. And when I get tired, I can't think. And when I can't think, I can't talk. And how many of you know when I can't talk, I can't pray? This is just one of the beautiful benefits of praying in the Spirit. It's transrational. It's Spirit. It's God praying through me. It's my soul praying prayers to the Lord that don't need to be communicated because it's my soul praying. And this is what Paul says. It's very clear. This is very good for people because it builds them up. Then he goes on to say in verse 5, I hope, I want all of you to speak in tongues. We know Paul was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Likely the, the event happened in Acts chapter 8 when Ananias prayed for him and his eyes were opened and he says, I speak in tongues more than all of you and I want you to speak in tongues. That's tongues. That's tongues by yourself. We're going to talk about tongues in a group setting because there is accountability required for that. Prophecy, on the other hand, is again inspired speech spoken from me to people. Now, in the Old Testament, when you read the prophets, so when you read Jeremiah or Isaiah or Ezekiel, all of the prophets were going through, my small group was going through a, a, a how to read the Bible, and we just did prophecy this last week. Prophets are a big portion of the Old Testament. Uh, most people don't realize prophecy is written as a form of poetry, but the big uh, structures of every prophetic book is simply this, where the prophet, the man who has been changed by God, ha has had an experience with God's power and his presence, he uh, accuses Israel or, or he identifies uh, in Israel areas of their walk with the Lord that doesn't line up with the covenant. Then what comes is an invitation to repent or confess. Now, a lot of times people assume, just like Dory was saying, you know, and I'm glad that she said what she said, that love is without truth. But the truth, 
actually sometimes hurts, but it can still be constructive if it's said in love. That's why chapter 13 is there, right? I mean, every time we use spiritual gifts, are we being loving? Are we being gentle? Are we being patient? Are we being kind? Are we operating in self-control, right? These are all directly applied to as the Spirit leads me. He's not going to lead me out of the character of God in terms of how I'm treating people. Because the final, the final theme or component of the prophetic books is hope. It always ends on hope because God knows that there will be moments that we fail, but God is never going to leave us in a place where all that's all we can experience. As long as you have breath in your lungs, there's hope. So pro prophecy always has to include the definition that Paul gives here in verse 3, which says it's for your upbuilding, it's for our encouragement, it's for consolation. So it's not just building up the individual, but in verse 4, Paul says it builds up the entire church. Also, prophecy can be given in the context of individual conversations. On Friday, I, I, saw, a, a, <laughs> I saw a counselor. I, I don't know why I, I feel weird saying that in front of you all, but I wanted to say it. I felt called to say it because I think some of you need to see a counselor. <laughs> it would make my job easier. <laughs> You better get counseling before you need counseling so that That's right. you won't need it later. Man, I am so far behind in this outline. I'm going to try to speak. <laughs> but while I was sitting there with that counselor, he said, can I pray for you? It was the last thing that we did together. And during the middle of his prayer, he stopped and he just said, I really feel like God wants you to hear this. And he said something in it. It was like God just read my mail. It was said in a beautiful way, a comforting way, an encouraging way, an upbuilding way. It wasn't weird. He was a Christian. He wants me to grow closer with Jesus. It was awesome. I came into that meeting needing to be built up, and I left that meeting having met with God. Do you know what I'm talking about? This is why prophecy is so powerful, because it is understandable communication from God to the church and to us for our upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. God is not done with you. There might be things that you are struggling with that you need to repent of and confess, but the end result is grace and hope. I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to bring you back to the promised land. I'm going to bring you back to your marriage. I'm going to bring you back to your kids. I'm going to bring you back to a fulfilling career that draws fruit and bears fruit so the world can see what it looks like. This is why spiritual gifts require us to earnestly desire them because all of us need building up and others need building up. We need more of the Holy Spirit and God wants to do more in us. I was speaking with Bill Richardson. Last week, and he mentioned something just so off the hand that I that I almost didn't pick up on it. But he said this about his wife, Donna. We all know Donna. If you don't know Donna, come to our church. We'll introduce you to Donna. She's a real person, and she is quite spicy. He said, he said to me, though, in the course of the conversation of our lunch, he said her pastor, when she was a young girl, like in her late elementary years, pulled her aside one day. And said, Donna, I believe that God wants you to know that you are going to work with kids someday. Now, fast forward, uh, Royal Family Kids Camp, a ministry that our church helped start, launched. And a year later, when they were given the invitation to work with these foster kids and kids coming from hurting and abuse situations, guess what she remembered? The word that her pastor gave her, that God gave her. And she said, this is my destiny. And God has now used Donna in the lives of countless kids to build up and not tear down. I have a very precious piece of paper in my wallet, in my, in my suit pocket. The date is February 7th, 2010. I do not know who wrote this. I do not know their name. I don't know if they're still alive, but at a church that I attended once, I walked in. And at the end of the service, a little old woman came up to me and she gave me this piece of paper. Because she knew how to use this gift. She didn't speak in tongues. She didn't say a word to me. She slipped this folded piece of paper into my palm. And do you want to know why I still have it? 
because it was a precious word from God at a very specific time in my life that I needed to hear these words. And I carried it around in my wallet until just like two years ago because I was afraid of this word getting washed or getting, you know, wet in the ocean or something. And I still have it. It is so powerful when someone speaks or writes an encouraging word to your life at a time that you know it. It can shape your destiny. This is what verse 6 says. Now, brothers, speaking in the context of a gathering here, I come to you, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring you some revelation or some knowledge or prophecy or teaching? If even lifeless instruments such as the flute or the harp do not give distinct notes, how will anyone know what is played? And if the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle? So with yourselves, if with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? For you will be speaking into the air. There are doubtless many different languages in the world, and none is without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner to the speaker and the speaker a foreigner to me. So with yourselves, since you are eager, eager for the manifestations of the spirit, strive to excel in the building up of the church. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I will pray with the spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not even know what you are saying? For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. It's so important for us to understand that tongues and prophecy are designed to build us up and to build the church up. Tongues in private builds us up because, again, it's transrational communication with God. It's prayers of thanks. It's, it's prayers of praise. It's prayers of thanksgiving. And when we pray that in English, we're built up. So how much more when you don't have to think of the words, you're just able to be free? I try to give the explanation. You know, when even when I'm standing up here and preaching, even when I feel the Holy Spirit just empowering my words. At max, it feels like I'm sprinting. But when I'm praying in the Spirit, I, I literally feel like I'm flying. That's the difference. Prophecy, though, is better in the context of church because what would you benefit if I was just up here babbling? Paul makes it very clear. Prophecy is better than tongues in the context of the body because no one understands someone speaking in tongues. As, as great as it is to be in a worship service where they're speaking another language, you can only feel what you're feeling. You don't understand what people are saying, right? There's no benefit to the body. That's what verse six says. And if someone does give an interpret, uh, uh, gives a message in tongues, verse 13, it must have an interpretation. I was reading a story about a John, uh, a 1987 conference where John Wimber was teaching on the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and there was in the in the worship setting there was a moment where someone gave a message in tongues, and then that person gave the interpretation. And then later, as John Wimber got up to teach on it, he said, "You know, our church was out of biblical order because when the person gave the message in tongues, they gave a prophecy, which is speech from God to you." By the way, preaching is also a form of prophecy. It's calling people to repentance, expounding the word of God, hopefully in a very clear way, so that people can have hope. That's for their upbuilding, encouragement, and comfort. But when someone gives a tongue, it's prayer to God. So it stands to reason that when that tongue is interpreted, it can still be a powerful prayer in the house and it can still encourage people and upbuild people but it's a prayer. A prayer is from me to God. The appropriate interpretation of a tongue in a corporate setting is and this might strike some people as being off because maybe you haven't experienced it like that it doesn't invalidate a very real prophetic word that someone else might have but that tongue still needs that prayer still needs to be interpreted 
so that people can be built up. One of the stories my brother shared uh, is when he went down to El Salvador, he went to a prayer meeting and there was this little nine-year-old girl who was, uh, was praying. And, you know, we're drawn to our natural language. We're drawn to the language that we were birthed with, right? That, that we learned as a young child. And we're drawn to it because it, there's so much about our language that expresses our identity and our heart. It's who we are. And it's, it's important. It's not just meaning. It's, it's connection to everything that we have, have identified as meaningful in life. The definitions are all in this language that we have. And he, he was, everyone was praying in Spanish, but there was this one little girl who was praying in English, and he, he wanted to just listen to her. So he walks up to her, and he just sits down. He's just listening to her for 45 minutes praying in English, and he wrote down all of her, her prayers. It was just so inspiring to him. He thought, how could a nine-year-old be praying this incredible prayer? This incredible, missional, spirit-led prayer. Nine-year-olds don't pray like this. Afterwards, he walked up to her and he said at this particular time, you know, I, you know, he had been praying about being a missionary and he had written just like, you know, I had this, this note that I kept. He had written down many of the lines in her prayer because it was so inspiring. And she looked at him when he said to her, where did you learn to pray like that? She looked at him with big eyes. Finally, the other pastor had to come over and say, Justin, she doesn't speak English. What's, what's happening? He said, well, I just heard her for 45 minutes praying in English. This is one of the examples that I gave earlier. Xenolalia, not just mysteries, but a known language that my brother understood. And if someone asked for an interpretation of the gathering had unbelievers, Justin literally could have said, she just prayed that God would send us to Ecuador and he would send us to Bolivia and God would send us to other parts of the world preaching the gospel that we'd be fully surrendered and that we would live the rest of our lives for God as a missionary people giving testimony to the greatness of who God is. Can you imagine if, if there were unbelievers, they would be like, wow. Especially if they realized that she didn't speak a lick of English. Prayer, praise, and thanksgiving is beneficial if it's interpreted or if the person understands it. Because then he says in verse 16, if an outsider comes in, they don't understand. This is what verse 18 says to go on. So he doesn't say stop. He says this, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words at a time. Brothers, do not be children in thinking, but be infants and evil, but in your thinking be mature. In the law it is written by the people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners will I speak to this people and even then they will not listen to me says the Lord. Those tongues are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers while prophecy is a sign not for unbelievers but for believers. I've always been messed up by that little phrase a sign for believers and a sign for unbelievers. I've always not understood that. Here's what I do know. Paul makes it very clear. Prophecy is better, but tongues is not something that we shouldn't desire. We should earnestly desire all the spiritual gifts, which includes tongues most of the time in our life with the Holy Spirit. That is the first gift that we experience. Right? But when I compare tongues and prophecy in the life of the church gathered together, Paul says, Again, he says in verse 18, I speak in tongues more than all of you, but in church prophecy is better. Verse 19. And then he says that tongues is a sign for unbelievers. Here's the critical component for us to understand this in the context. It is a negative sign. He's referencing Isaiah 28 and the Assyrian judgment on Israel. How many of you know that when the Assyrians came down and they took, they took the Israelites, the Israelites did not know what they were saying because they spoke a different language. But prophecy, on the other hand, is a positive sign for believers. And a secondary impact is that when an unbeliever sees this and hears this, they may be inclined towards repentance and towards moving to where the rest of the congregation is moving in response to that prophetic word. Right. In response to this encouragement. Hey, love your wives. That's what God would say to you. <laughs> well, if an unbeliever heard that and they were struggling, in fact, a couple weeks ago, I was preaching. And uh, someone came to the service. It was the only time he had, has ever been to a service. We're friends. And he said to me, Jordan, did you know I was coming to the service? It was the service where I was talking about husbands. 
It was the one message he needed to hear. Out of any message in scripture, that was the message he needed to hear that day. And he said to me afterwards, I can't believe that you talked about what you talked about. I said, talk to God. I had nothing to do with it. I just try to speak to what he's asking me to speak on. And tongues is a negative sign because people don't understand this is what I need to do to repent and to have hope again. But prophecy, on the other hand, whether it's through scripture or whether it's through someone singing over you or whether it's through someone praying over you in the back corner, whether it's just in a conversation as you're interacting with someone, whether it's in a counseling room and the person says something, it motivates you. It is a positive sign that God is with me. Here's the bottom line. A built up body is a bridge for believers and unbelievers, especially to worship God. This is how Paul says it in verse 23. If therefore the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues and an outsider or unbeliever enters, will they not say that you are out of your mind? Because they don't understand unless God empowers that. But if all prophesy, prophesy and an unbeliever or outsider enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed. And so falling on his face, he will worship and declare that God is really amongst you. Do you want to know really why we need the spiritual gifts? It's not just so that we can be built up. It's because a built up body creates a bridge for non-believers to walk across and worship. That's why all of the spiritual gifts are going to be no longer in heaven. But Paul says so clearly in chapter 13 that love remains. Love is forever. But preaching, but prophesying, but prayer, I mean, excluding just having a face-to-face -face conversation like Moses had with God, but prayer in the way that we pray and encouragement in the way that we encourage and tapping into the Holy Spirit and giving words of knowledge, all of those will cease because we're there face to face. There will be no need. I want you to stand, stand with me. We got off to a rocky start, did we? And I'll probably have to re-preach that message and re-record it, but that's okay. Um, but if there's one thing I want you to leave today's service with, it's, it's simply this. God has more. I, I, I don't care about the theological mumbo jumbo that you use. I don't care about the jargon that you use. I just want you to understand this, that God has more for you. For every single one of you. If you're 90 years old and you have lived a lifestyle of being filled with the Holy Spirit every day, all the time, God has more for you. God has more for you in this particular season because there are still people who need to experience a built up body that gives testimony to people, that gives people room to think about things in ways they haven't, in ways that they need so that they can walk across that bridge and say Jesus is Lord, to fall on their knees and worship God, to know that God is amongst us. And that is why we need to constantly be asking for more. We need to be hungry. And if we're content with the wrong things, we'll never be discontent with the right things. Because until God pours his spirit into us in ways that give us more understanding and more reach and more of what we need to reach this world, he's not done. He's not done. So he is going to continue to pour out his spirit, like the prophet Joel says, on all sons and all daughters, on males, on females, on little kids, on big kids, on old people, on everyone. Because the church needs everyone to be hungry and leveraging God's uniqueness of who he's created them to be so that who God has created them to be can reach the person they have been specifically and uniquely designed to reach. Just like that counselor said something I needed to hear in that moment. That's exactly how God can and will use you if you're open. Father, we invite you to this space and this place in our hearts. God, we submit, we surrender. We ask that you forgive us. Lord, we know that there are reasons you say no. There are reasons you say slow down. There are reasons you say speed up. There are reasons you say move. There are reasons you are directing our path. You know exactly what it is that we need to hear at the moment we need to hear it. And for other people who need to hear it at that moment and experience it in that way. And so, Lord, we surrender not just our tongues, but everything to you. God, we do surrender our tongues. The most evil, according to James 3, instrument of our body to you but lord let it follow a heart that is totally surrendered to you jesus
everything. Right now in this moment, God, we ask for more in the name of Jesus. Amen.